Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In April of 1965, an Atlas Agena took off from Vandenberg Air Force Base, carrying a payload which was, well, unique in the US space program. It was going to be called Snapshot. That is, it was a space shot from the SNAP program, Systems for Nuclear Auxiliary Power. Yes, this rocket was carrying a nuclear payload, specifically a nuclear reactor. In the 1950s, the US anticipated that there would be a need for nuclear power sources in space, and there are many missions still operating today, the oldest of which are the Voyager spacecraft headed off into deep space, but we also have on Mars the rovers Perseverance and Curiosity. These are powered by radioisotope thermoelectric generators, which use decaying radioactive materials to drive as a heat source to drive thermocouples and generate electrical power. But SNAP covered the full spectrum of nuclear power technology, and they did in fact develop multiple reactor designs, and one of these got flown in space. This design was specifically called SNAP-10A. They had started building small reactors very early on in the program, things like SNAP-2, and there was a lot of ground testing of devices before they got confident enough that they could actually fly one in space and have it operate safely. So this reactor was extraordinarily small for spaceflight. In fact, this is supposed to be them assembling the reactor, putting in the fuel rods by hand one by one. It was, of course, designed in such a manner that it wouldn't go critical under these circumstances. To make it go critical, they would have these rotating beryllium neutron reflectors, which would uh, reflect neutrons back into the core and therefore push it above the critical geometry. So much of the time when you're talking about nuclear reactions, we talk about critical mass, when in fact the mass is dependent on the geometry. In fact, there have been cases where accidents have involved unfavorable geometries. Unfavorable in that they killed somebody. But as far as I know, there weren't any criticality accidents with this reactor. To get the compact size, they use highly enriched uranium, something like 93% enrichment, which is more than what they used for atomic weapons. This uranium would be converted into fuel elements by uh, turning it into an alloy of uranium-zirconium hydride. You might remember my video about the Trigger reactor, a reactor which is so safe that uh, high school students were allowed to operate it, and that's because uranium-zirconium hydride has a highly negative temperature coefficient. That is, the hotter it gets, the less it wants to react. So this would allow it to passively control its power output. So there were 37 of these fuel rods in the core, and each of them contained about 150 grams of uranium. That was, of course, mixed with about 1.2 kilograms of zirconium and some hydrogen, and then that was wrapped with a hastaloy, which I believe is hafnium uh, your tungsten. That was the hard protective fuel cladding that was supposed to protect the fuel from physical damage, because the fuel was a, a, a bit more brittle. So in total, there's only about five and a half kilograms of uranium in this reactor. And yeah, that is significantly below the bare critical mass for uranium-235. It's because of the geometry and the stuff surrounding the reactor that they are able to make it go critical. The reactor was designed to operate at a thermal power of about 30 kilowatts, which was way more power than any spacecraft of the era needed. But that is, of course, deceptive because the actual electrical power output was only about 500 watts. The conversion step to go from heat to electricity was really inefficient. It used a series of thermocouples that were attached to those radiators. The conical structure at the bottom, that held all the radiating surface for the small reactor at the top. Notice how big the radiators have to be relative to the size of the reactor. This is a common feature of spacecraft power systems where to get the best thermal efficiency you have to have the largest gradient between the hot spot and the cold spot and that means the largest radiators possible. So now the way the power generation would work is that the reactor would be cooled and the coolant would flow down pipes towards the back of these radiators and then they would be connected through these thermocouples that used uh, silicon germanium th uh, thermocouples to basically convert the heat, the thermal gradient into electrical power. And the coolant for this reactor is, well, it's kind of cool. It's called NAC. 
That's uh, Na for sodium and K for potassium. It's a mixture of the two of those. And while these are metals that are solid at room temperature, if you make the perfect alloy of them, you get what's called a eutectic mixture, which uh, the melting point is below freezing. It's like about minus nine Celsius. And also it makes a great coolant because its boiling point is close to something like 800 Celsius. And there's another cool advantage of using liquid metal to cool your reactors. Uh, that is, you can actually pump it using magnetohydrodynamics with no moving parts. And it would be really cool to say that they did that here, except that they didn't. They actually just pumped it using more conventional pumps, albeit ones which were sealed and were driven using magnetic forces to drive the rotors internally. And if the idea of a nuclear reactor and a highly reactive alkali metals like you know, potassium and sodium it make it sound pretty scary, you know, the scientists weren't even done yet because they had planning for a more efficient power conversion system. Those solid state converters weren't particularly good and they wanted to use a more powerful and more efficient Rankine cycle. That is where you take a liquid, you heat it up until it boils and as the vapor expands you use that to drive turbines. Now normally we do this on earth with water but they thought that they could do it with mercury. That's right, you would boil the mercury, use that to drive the turbines and then you would recover it. Now despite developing and testing this it never obviously got to fly but yeah, did you know that in the US there were actually a handful of electrical power plants, you know, traditional coal-fired power plants, which used a mercury vapor system as the first stage of their power production to get more efficiency out? This was clearly in the days when, uh, you know, environmental rules weren't quite the same. And, you know, the scientists developing this project very clearly thought about the environmental issues of launching a nuclear reactor into space. As we saw earlier, before it started up, it was something which could be handled by a human. But once the reactor had been turned on, it would fill up with, uh, you know, fission products and it would become incredibly radioactive and you would not want that returning to Earth and landing someplace for people to find. So yeah, part of the mission requirements was that the reactor wouldn't be activated until it was in a high stable orbit. And in that high stable orbit, it would stay for thousands of years, allowing the fission products to decay. But furthermore, they wanted to verify that the spacecraft would disintegrate and burn up uh, when it returned to Earth, you know, millennia hence. So they started out obviously with designs which were expected to disintegrate during the forces of re-entry. They performed tests in plasma wind tunnels to verify that the results were at least somewhat consistent with what they thought. And then they actually built up a dummy reactor which used depleted uranium instead of uranium-235. It couldn't go critical in this state. And because it wasn't going critical, they didn't need any of the radiators or the pumps or other pieces of hardware which would add to the launch mass. That allowed them to shrink the mass of the object down a whole lot and that let them use a smaller rocket. So we got a suborbital flight of the Scout carrying this in a uh, trajectory which would take it up above the atmosphere, bring it sideways down range, and then they could watch it disintegrate using, you know, cameras, I guess, from the ground. And so after all that testing, they showed that the reactor would burn up in the upper atmosphere, leaving basically radioactive dust at altitude. It would pro introduce less radioactivity than a, an atmospheric nuclear test, which sounds pretty bad, except that they were doing them all the time back then. So they were saying, well, at least we're better than those guys over there. And you know what, if that turns out to be no longer acceptable, as I suspect it may well be, uh, it's still up there. It'll be up there for at least another thousand years. That gives us plenty of time to figure out what to do with this thing that is orbiting in space. By the way, while you're at it, there's a whole bunch of other uh, Soviet nuclear reactors orbiting, which we'd like to deal with too. As it happens, the US almost didn't even launch this one reactor. Uh, by middle of 1964, it was looking like this reactor test in space was going to be cancelled. And it took some, uh, you know, political campaigning, I guess, some uh, lobbying to actually get it to progress all the way through to a launch. So the reactor was going to be paired with an Atlas Agena. It was going to sit on top of the Agena spacecraft bus. So that would provide most of the propulsion to get it into its target orbit, and uh, the fairing would neatly sit over the conical reactor at the front. 
The launch was performed out of Vandenberg, which I guess had the benefit of being closest to where the reactor was actually being developed, so didn't have to travel as far. But I think also the trajectory allowed them to stay over water for most of the initial launch. If there was anything that went wrong in the first orbit, they would be able to make sure the thing ended up landing in the ocean safely, or at the very least less dangerously than if it had landed on land. But all those contingencies were not needed. The booster performed as expected. It dropped its uh, you know, booster engines, used the sustainer, separated the Agena. It went into the initial orbit and then raised it into the high orbit. And uh, they were getting ready for the test. Now, this was not the only payload on this vehicle. The Agena spacecraft bus, they were going to carry some other stuff. One of which was the first ion engine in space, a cesium ion based gridded ion thruster, which actually had to operate from batteries because the reactor only produced 500 watts and they needed something like, you know, seven times that. It would only be three and a half hours into the flight before they gave the order to turn on the reactor. So the, as I said, they turn it on by rotating these neutron reflectors into position. There was four of them. Two of them were just rotated 100% position. And then there was the two fine control ones, which were slowly rotated in bit by bit by ground command. And six hours later, the reactor achieved criticality and began you know, reacting in orbit. For the next seven days, they would manually adjust these uh, reflectors, monitor how the reactor performed, and you know, ramp it up to power. But after you know the first week or so, they just left them in their final position, and the reactor was stable. They demonstrated the ability for the reactor to perform and to sustain the reaction without any ground input due to its natural stability. And as for that other big experiment, the gridded ion thruster, was a bit of a disaster. So apparently they had all sorts of electrical arcing issues and that produced a voltage, you know, electromagnetic interference, which messed with the horizon sensor sensors and the spacecraft like lost control. So they eventually had to shut the thing down, isolate it and, uh, you know, forget about that for the time being. The reactor had been designed to operate for a year, but unfortunately it never got to demonstrate that because there was some sort of glitch with the uh, Agena spacecraft. It was an error related to the high voltage power system that you know, triggered an emergency. And as part of the emergency procedures, the uh, reactor went into safe mode. What it did was essentially released like a band which popped open and that meant that the neutron reflectors were jettisoned from around the core. Now they weren't jettisoned into space, they were still attached by cables, but once these were pushed out, the reactor shut down and the operations ceased. Uh, at that point, the Agena was on battery power. It continued for like another few days before finally shutting down. So while the reactor demonstrated it worked on orbit, it didn't demonstrate that it would operate for an entire year in space because of a failure of the supporting spacecraft. This was not believed to be anything to do with the relatively hard radiation environment that was coming from the reactor at the top. It was believed to be something inherent in the electronics rather than anything else. While the SNAP program had developed other reactors, none of them had flown in space. It would actually develop a number of uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, which would find their way onto spacecraft. But the specific you know, niche for which a 500 watt nuclear reactor would make sense never really materialized. The Soviet Union would fly many reactors. These would power radar satellites that had to operate at low altitudes and therefore didn't want to have large solar panels for drag reasons. And with returning to the moon, perhaps to stay becoming part of a, you know, US space policy, we are seeing talk and discussion and development of new reactor designs. And perhaps if everything works out, I'll get to talk about one of these things being operated in space. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.